There are several thermal analysis techniques, such as TGA, DSC, and TMA. But no matter what you're working with, accurate, reproducible data is important. Achieving that requires careful selection of experimental conditions, meaningful evaluation, and interpretation of results. Hello, my name is Kadeen Mohammed, Applications Manager at TA Instruments, and I am pleased to welcome you to Strategies for Better Thermal Analysis Data. In this three-part series, we will consider instrumental effects, sample preparation, method development, and data reduction in presentation. Additional resources and links to other presentations in the series can be accessed by clicking the resources widget below. If you have any questions during or after the presentation, feel free to ask them through the Q&A window and they will be answered by TA application scientists. In the first segment of Strategies for Better Thermal Analysis Data, we join Louis Wagesbeck to discuss instrument fundamentals and sample preparation. Hello, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for the first of three presentations on strategies for better thermal analysis data from TA Instruments. This is the first of three segments that will be presented by TA's product specialists. This first segment is entitled Instrument and Sample Preparation. The agenda today is going to cover three things. We're going to calibrate and talk about verification of your instrument. We're going to talk about knowing your instrument's capabilities and talk about good sample preparation at the end. When we talk about calibration, the first question might be, why do you calibrate? Well, when you bought an instrument from TA Instruments, it was installed, set up, and calibrated by TA service specialist. These specialists calibrate the instrument with ASTM standards so that it gets the best performance. At that point, why should you recalibrate again? Well, over time, the sensors can age, electronics can drift, oxide layers can form in the DSC sensor, sample could get spilled into the cell and has to be cleaned. These are all reasons that you might need to recalibrate. But how do you know when to recalibrate? Well, what we're going to talk about is verification. How often do you do that really depends upon you and your standard operating procedures. Some labs calibrate daily, some labs calibrate weekly, some labs calibrate monthly. We recommend that you calibrate once a week and verify the performance of your instrument, and when it's out of performance, then you recalibrate the instrument. This next slide shows a verification of a DSC cell by running indium. We plot heat flow versus temperature. We're looking at the melt of the indium. The onset of that melt is 156.64 degrees. That's only 0.04 degrees C away from the true melting of indium. The heat effusion is only 0.11 joules per gram away from the true value. That's a very good value. It's right in spec where I would want it to be. I'm ready to run samples now. I don't have to worry about calibrating this instrument. The calibrations that we do really depend on which DSC you have. For the DSC for the Q20 DSC, we have a baseline calibration. We're going to talk about each of these specifically here in a minute. For T0 DSCs, like the Q2000 and the Discovery DSC, we have a T0 calibration. All the DSCs have a cell constant calibration. All the DSCs have a temperature calibration. The Q2000 and the Discovery DSC has a direct heat capacity calibration. For TGAs, we have weight calibration and temperature calibration. The baseline calibration that's done on non-T0 DSCs, like the Q20, is to correct for any offset and drift in the baseline. So if you look at the graph here, we see the black curve that is our before calibration data. We're going to take that data, we're going to rotate it around zero, and that's going to give us our calibrated baseline. It still has curvature, but it's now relatively flat and right around zero. When we look at the T0 calibration, the T0 calibration is not just taking it and rotating it. The T0 calibration is not subtracting. 
With the T0 calibration, we measure and quantify any inherent asymmetry in the DSC cell. We're going to take that and compensate for that. So if we look at this, the before calibration looks the same. The after calibration looks a flat line at zero. That's really what it should be. It should be a flat line at zero. That should be the baseline of an instrument that's performing properly. With the T0 calibration, this is performed in a couple steps. The first is we scan the empty calorimeter. The second calibration is involved running a known weight of sapphire so that we can measure the heat flow of the sapphire and the sensors. We take those values into compensation in the instrument and we put the values into the four term heat flow equation shown before below. Of this, we've got the first term is the sample contribution, the delta T divided by resistance. The other three terms are the instrument contributions. We're going to talk more about those on the next slide. If we do the T0 calibration and we plot out the resistance and the capacitance, it looks like what we see here on the graph. The resistance should be decreasing with increasing temperature and the capacitance is increasing with increasing temperature. Both these curves, the resistances should be close together, the same as the capacitance, but they don't have to be exactly the same. We're no longer assuming they're the same, we're now measuring to see what they are. The main thing you want to look at when you look at this capacitance and resistance is that we don't see any transitions in there. We don't see any peaks. We see curves that go down or go up rather smoothly, like shown in the graph. The benefit of this T0 calibration is shown here. The green curve is a Q20 DSC. And if you look at that, it's centered around zero, but we see about 100 microwatts of baseline curvature. Now that's not bad compared to some DSCs on the market, but we believe it should be better. And we can get better by doing a T0 calibration. And the Discovery DSC is shown here in the red curve. We see a nice flat line at zero. That's going to give us the best baseline. We're going to talk about in the next section about knowing what the performance of your instrument is and we'll talk more about that. The next calibration we're going to talk about is cell constant and temperature calibration. This is done by running a sample that we know the value for, something like indium. And the cell constant is going to correct for any heat loss that's made to the surroundings. It's performed by using indium and running it in the DSC cell, looking at the melt and comparing the literature value of the heat of fusion to the, what we measure in the DSC. In temperature calibration, we're going to measure what we see in the DSC and compare that to what it's supposed to be, or the literature value. Now this can be done in one sample. We can run indium and get both cell constant and temperature calibration. Now our software allows for five temperature calibration points, but generally you only need one. That's what we use because our DSC has got a very linear response and we typically use one point. But by all means, you can use five if you want. Now this shows an example of indium that we've ran in the DSC to do a calibration for cell constant and temperature. And here you see the integration of the peak of the indium and we've got the literature value for the heat of fusion, 28.71, and dividing that by what we measure, 27.77. This gives us a cell constant of 1.03. It's cell constant should be right around one, slightly above. This is very good result of what I would expect for a cell constant. The temperature calibration is done from the same file by looking at the onset of melting. And we can see here, we measure 157.89. It's supposed to be 156.61. We're gonna do a correction for that. That way we can get the correct temperature. You, got, you don't have to use indium, but here's some other materials that could be used. Benzoic acid, urea, indium are some of the more popular. But typically, indium is the most common sample used for, for cell constant. For temperature calibrations, as I said, you could use up to five points, but here we've got a list of different materials that can be used. We would typically use metal standards like indium, tin, lead, or zinc, but there's other samples that can be used as seen here. Now, in our DSC cells, we, we get a question of whether you need to calibrate for heating rate. And in our DSC cells, that's not necessary. 
by design, TA Instruments DSCs do not require rate-dependent calibration procedure. Now, how do you know that? How can we prove that? Well, here's data where we ran indium from 0 0.05 degrees a minute up to 20 degrees a minute. And when we plot these out and we look at the melting onset between all these nine runs, it only varies by 0.1 degrees, a very, very small change over that wide range of heating rate. It's not necessary to, to change calibration for a different heating rate. Now the heat capacity calibration is used to get the direct value of heat capacity on a T0 DSC like the Q2000 or the Discovery DSC. And we do this by taking the literature value of heat capacity of a known material, typically we use sapphire, and compare that to what we measure. Now on a Q2000, we're going to take that value at a temperature, and we're going to divide it as this equation shows. And typically we would do that in the middle of the range, or you could do it at multiple points and average it. Now on the Discovery DSC, instead of taking a single point, we're going to take the whole curve and we're going to fit a curve to that. So it's now is going to be a temperature dependent function. This is going to give us a better measurement of heat capacity. And if I look here, I've got a plot of the red curve is sapphire literature value. The green curve is the measured heat capacity off a of Discovery DSC. And you can see that it matches up very well with that red curve. The blue curve is my heat capacity calibration constant, or KCP. And you can see that that does change a little bit with temperature. And when you look at this, you see it go up, it goes back down, it goes back up. But look at the scale. The scale is very, very small, from 0.99 to 1.03 joules per gram degree C. It's very, very small change, but it's there. And to get the best measurement of heat capacity, we want to measure that. Now to switch gears now and talk about TGA. In TGA, the first thing we have is weight calibration. And weight calibration in a vertical TGA, like the Q500, the Q50, the Discovery TGA, is performed by loading a standard weight onto a pan and measuring an offset. If we put a 100 milligram weight and it's 99.99, it's then we put a little bit of an offset in there in order to get 100 milligrams. On the SDT, the Q600, which is a horizontal beam balance, we put two weights and we run an experiment. And this experiment is done to compensate not only for weight, but also drift and buoyancy. And that's required on the vertical instrument or the horizontal instrument due to beam growth and buoyancy changes. And while we recommend that you periodically do the weight calibration on a TGA, it's not as important on DSC. Typically in TGA, we're looking at normalized value, meaning percent weight change. And if I look at percent, whether that's got a calibration or not really doesn't affect the accuracy of the measurement. If I look at exact micrograms or milligrams of weight, then the weight, ac the weight calibration affects the accuracy. Temperature calibrations on TGA are done by using Curie points on the standard TGAs, and that's by ASTM E1582. You can also do Curie points on the SDT, or because the SDT is also a DSC, you can look at melt standards. Now, what is a Curie point temperature? A Curie point temperature is the temperature where a material that's magnetic is no longer magnetic. So we have a sample that's, got a, that's magnetic. We put a magnet pulling onto the sample. It shows a weight gain. As we get to the Curie temperature where it's no longer magnetic, that would show up as an apparent weight loss. That's our Curie temperature. Now we're going to do this, and we're going to show you an example of it here in a second, but we're going to compare that value to the literature value for the Curie point. That's going to give us our temperature calibration. And on the SDT, we can do that, or we can use melting standards of metals. Now, on TGA, we allow five temperature calibration points. Typically, I would use two or three on a TGA. If I look at this schematic of what we're doing on TGA temperature calibration, this is for a vertical TGA. You can see that we've got a sample in the furnace. We've got a magnet that's put underneath that sample. Now, if we look at the little inset there that shows our data, we've got our weight signal. We put the magnet, we see a weight gain. As we heat along up to the point where we get to the Curie point, where it's no longer magnetic, 
we see a weight loss. The offset, or where it returns back to our non-magnetic weight, that is the Curie temperature. That's the definition. Now, the Discovery TGA includes an electromagnet in the furnace, so you don't have to put a manual magnet underneath it. Makes it a little bit easier. Now, here shows an example of Curie temperatures on a vertical TGA. This shows alumel and nickel. And we're heating it up. You can see initially there's a magnetic field applied, and we see the sample weight go up. And then as we're running, we see it drop down as we go through the Curie temperature of the alumel, and then drop down again as we go through the Curie temperature of the nickel. And the offset there that I've got circled in red is that Curie point. And you put that in the table in the software where you put the measured value and the literature value, and the instrument will correct for that change. Now on TMA, we can calibrate temperature, and we can also calibrate cell constant. The cell constant on a TMA is so that we can get the best measurement of thermal expansion. And we calibrate this using a well-defined material that we know the coefficient of thermal expansion form, such as aluminum. It's very common. But we can also use things like borosilicate glass and other materials that we know what the coefficient of thermal expansion is. TMA temperature calibrations are performed using melting standards like aluminum, indium, copper, uh, etc. Now here we show the TMA calibration curve for aluminum. And you see we're plotting dimension change versus temperature. And we can take the slope of that line, which is going to give us the coefficient of thermal expansion. And here we measure 21.9 micrometers per meter degree C, and it really should be 24.9. And so that gives us a cell constant of 1.13. Typically, it's somewhere around 1.1 or 1.2 for a cell constant on TMA. And this is going to give us the best measurement of coefficient expansion when we start running our samples. When we do temperature calibration, we're going to take a melting standard, we're going to put it on the probe, we're going to or the stage, we're going to put a probe on it, and we're going to heat it up and look for the indentation when it softens. And that's shown from this graph where we're shot plotting dimension change versus temperature. As our indium goes to melt, the probe penetrates into the sample, and we can see that here at 159.67. And so we put that into the table, and that's going to correct for that temperature offset. That section we talked about calibration and verification. Now, when you calibrate and verify your instrument, you need to understand what are the instrument's capabilities. What can we do on the instrument in order to get the right data, and what right data do we expect? We're going to show you now some ways to think about the capabilities of the instrument. So how do you quantify the instrument performance? What level of performance will we expect from your instrument? Now, technical specifications that you can get off a website, you can get off a data sheet, they're going to represent the best data that can become off that instrument. If I have an instrument set up in perfect conditions, that's going to be my best data. And as instruments age over time, the data may not be quite the same. So you need to determine two things. What performance do you need in order to run your samples? That may not be the same that the instrument can do in the best world performance. It may not be that good. Maybe we have a baseline that's 10 microwatts, but if you have 20 microwatts, that's more than enough. So that's what you need to think about. Once you know that, then you need to run your instrument and see, is the instrument performing up to what you need it to be? If it's not, then you need to recalibrate or figure out what you can do to improve the performance. Now here shows an example of a way to check for baseline for a Discovery DSC. And if I look here, I've got a, dot, a plot of the baseline off a of Discovery DSC. It's centered right around zero. It's got a little bit of drift down and up, but it's centered right around zero. I've got a blue bar driven there, drawn there that shows that this is excellent performance. If I'm inside that bar, I've got great performance. The green is still good. That shouldn't be a problem. I can still get great data. If it's out into the red, at that point, I might want to check the T0 calibration. I might want to check my baseline. 
Now here, we're showing a baseline, and this is what you should see. It should be a little down, a little up, but it shouldn't be sloping a lot in one direction, and it shouldn't have any transitions, like a peak in the endothermic or exothermic up or down direction. For a Q2000 DSC, the performance spec is a little bit wider. And here we show a data off a Q2000 DSC. The blue bar is now a little bit bigger, plus or minus 20 microwatts. If I'm in that, that's excellent. The green is even a little bit bigger. And then I get into the red, I need to check the T0 calibration. Now this is not the spec of the instrument, but this is a good guideline for helping you determine is my instrument performing the way I need it to perform in order to get my data? Now, when we talk about specifications and we talk about what the instrument can do, sensitivity is one that's used a lot. So if you look on the website, you look on a data sheet, you'll see a sensitivity value. And it's a number that's put on a data sheet, but it's really more than just a number. Sensitivity could be partially from digital resolution of electronics, but this by itself is not a sensitivity measurement. Short-term measurement of noise is also a way to define sensitivity. But this is also not just a measurement of sensitivity. In true real life, what we're doing with our instruments, the baseline or the drift of the baseline is probably one of the most important parts for determining true sensitivity, whether we can see a sample. That's really what we're looking for. Can I see my transition? So when we talk about sensitivity, Real sensitivity depends on the baseline of your instrument. If I'm trying to measure a small sample and my baseline's flat, I'm going to see it. If I've got a quadratic curvature in the baseline, I'm not going to tend to see it. Here we show the blue curve is a Discovery DSC baseline. The black is a 10 microwatt DSC step change, looking at a glass transition. If I look at that black curve compared to the blue curve, I can easily see that I'll be able to measure that glass transition. Now, if I have another DSC that's got this bigger curvature that I show here in the red, I'm not going to be able to measure that 10 microwatt glass transition. Here, the change in the baseline is bigger than the change that I'm seeing from my data. So I have to understand what the DSC does and whether I can measure those small transitions. Now, when we look at TGA and we look at performance, we're looking at drift of the weight as we heat it up into the TGA furnace. Now here we're showing weight in micrograms, and plus or minus five micrograms around zero is excellent performance. And that's what we'd expect with the Discovery DSC, Discovery TGA. And on the Discovery TGA, we would expect it to be within this five micrograms. If I look at a Q500 or a Q5000, it's going to be wider than that. And then I need to think about what I need to do in order to measure my sample. If I have a sample that's only got a 10 microgram weight change, if my drift is 50 micrograms, I'm not going to be able to measure that. But if my drift is only 3 micrograms, I'm going to be able to make that measurement. Now when we talk about measurement precision, measurement repeatability, and measurement accuracy, you'll see these numbers on a spec sheet. But what do they mean? When we talk about precision, this is the ability of the instrument to make a measurement without any other variables. So if I'm measuring an indium sample, I'm putting it in the DSC cell and I'm running it multiple times, but I'm not opening the lid, I'm not taking the sample out. That's a good measurement of the instrument, but it's not a very real world measurement for what we're doing when we run samples. Repeatability is a more real world measurement. In repeatability, we're going to see how the instrument reproduces when we take the sample in and out of the DSC cell or TGA sample. So whatever instrument we're looking at, we're going to take it in and out of the measurement and make sure that we get a repeatability that way. Repeatability is critical if we're going to get accuracy. If we can't make repeatable measurements, we can't make accurate measurements. When we talk about repeatability and precision, we can look at the data here. Now this data here is precision. So we've got 10 replicate indium runs that are all laid on top of each other. And you can see how well they lay on top of each other. And I, below that, I've got the values for Discovery DSC for temperature precision and repeatability and calorimetric precision and repeatability. 
And you can see that the precision me measurement is much better than the repeatability. Because in precision, we're not taking the sample out. But once we take it out, there's another factor that's being introduced. But if I look at that repeatability, plus or minus 0 0.025 degrees, that's still very good. I'm very happy with that. Now we start running other samples, they're not going to be quite as close as indium. If I look at a polymer melt, it's going to see a little bit more variation than what I would see off my indium sample. However, I can still do the same thing by looking at precision, in this case, of a high-density polyethylene sample. And you can see we've got 10 runs, we've got all the values for onset, for the maximum, for the area, we've got the average value, the standard deviation, and once again, you can see very good agreement between those 10 runs. We're getting very precise data. If we look at a polymer TG now, now we're looking at repeatability. So because it's repeatability, this sample's coming in and out of the DSC cell. And you can see, once again, very good agreement, but there's a little shift between the curves. On the next slide shows the numbers for that. We see the onset, the midpoint of the TGs, the change in heat capacity at the TG. And once again, we can look at the average and the standard deviation for that. And once again, we see very good results. So we're getting nice, repeatable results in addition to getting precision. Now on TGA, when we're looking at a sample like calcium oxalate, we're going to get repeatability, not precision, because we're going to have to load a fresh sample each time. But here we have eight different runs that were ran in the TGA. Now important thing if you're doing this is it needs to be the same sample mass and the same heating rate. But here we see there's eight files there overlaid and you can see very good agreement. They lay on top of each other very, very well. The next curve, next graph shows the data for that. And once again, looking at the average and the standard deviation, you can see very good repeatability between those eight runs. Now, calcium oxalate is not a calibration standard, but it's a good check of the instrument. Is my instrument performing like I expect it to? Am I getting the weight loss for each step that I expect? If I run multiple runs, is it repeatable? These are the things that I'm checking for in order to make sure that the instrument's running the way it should. Now, so far today, we've talked about calibration, and we've talked about understanding the performance of our instrument. Next, we're going to talk about good sample prep. Now, you can have the best instrument that's calibrated perfectly, but if you don't have good sample prep, your data is not going to be good. So good sample prep is very, very important. And so good sample prep really depends on, when we start talking about DSC, we got to think about which pan are we going to put it in? And then how are we going to load the sample in the pan effectively? Now for DSC, there's multiple pan types. And really the pan type depends upon what you're running. There's standard pans that are appropriate for most solid samples like films and powders, metals, polymers that we slice off a piece of. There's hermetic pans that are good for samples with volatiles, that we want to maintain those volatiles inside the pan. They can also be used for some small quantities of liquid. We have specialty pans, like the high volume pans, that can be used for much bigger samples, and also can maintain that hermetic seal. And then we have high pressure pans. These can be used for samples that generate large quantities of gas, and high pressures are generated as the sample goes through volatilization. So the right pan really depends upon the sample. Here shows the T0 pans from TA Instruments. And the T0 pan has been engineered so the bottom of the pan is extremely flat. We're going to talk about that here in a second, but we want that flat bottom of the pan sitting on the flat sensor. That gives us our best contact so we'll get the best performance. And with the T0 pans, they start off flat, but they stay flat even after we put a sample and put a lid into it. The T0 pan can be configured with a standard lid where we crimp a sample and hold it in place, or a hermetic lid that is sealed to keep volatiles in. We also have a low mass T0 pan that's used for very low mass and thin samples. Now, it can matter which sample pan you use. Not all samples are this dramatic, but this is a pharmaceutical monohydrate sample where the blue curve is a vented pan and the green curve is a sealed pan. And if you look at this data, it's dramatically different. In the blue curve, the vented pan, 
we see a broad endotherm at the beginning of the run. This is due to the volatilization of the hydrate that comes out of the sample. As that dehydrates, the sample loses its crystalline structure. As we continue to heat, we see an exotherm where it crystallizes, and then we see melting. But the original sample existed as a hydrate. If we want to run that sample as a hydrate and characterize it that way, we need to run it in a sealed pan to keep that water in that sample. And then we see the green curve, where it's a different data. Sometimes you may want to run it both ways, but it's important to understand that the pan type can change your data. The bottom of the sample pan needs to be flat. I mentioned that earlier. And on our T0 pans, we keep the bottoms very flat and it sits on our sensor that's also very flat. And that's going to give you the best contact and the best thermal performance. Now, if I have too big a sample that makes the bottom of the pan curve like this, the pan can rock, as we show here in the one slide. Or if I make it and print it where it's curved like this, it can also not sit flat. We're not going to get a very good thermal contact that way. The flat pan on a flat sensor is going to give us our best thermal contact, and that's going to give us our best performance. Sample shape. Once again, it somewhat depends on what the sample is. The ideal sample for DSC is a film that I can punch out and lay in the bottom of the pan. But real world, I take my sample and I make it fit in the pan. But I want the sample to be thin. I want it to cover as much of the bottom of the pan as possible. If it's a large piece of sample, like a pellet or a part, I want to shave off a thin section of that. I don't want to crush it. I don't want to smash it. I want to cut a thin section so that it can sit across the bottom of that. If it's a pellet, cut a cross section through the middle. Lay that in the bottom like a film. That's going to give me my best performance. If it's a part, shave off a thin piece of that. If it's a liquid, liquids can be problematic, especially a lot of liquids have high surface tension. Here we show a drop of liquid right in the center of the pan. Now, if I put that drop of liquid there and I put my lid on and get it sealed, that'll work pretty well. However, if that drop of liquid gets over to the corner of the pan, surface tension can cause that to creep up the wall. If it gets up into the sealing surface, it's not gonna seal properly. And then the pan won't be sealed like I want it to be. So it's very important to prepare it properly. So when you look at liquids, generally try to start off with a drop right in the center is going to give you your best performance. Now in a DSC experiment, we also need to think about sample size. And sample size is a trade-off between sensitivity and resolution. Larger samples equals more sensitivity. But smaller samples will give you better resolution. So general, we think about the smallest sample possible that allows us to see the transitions we're looking for. Now, really how big that sample depends somewhat on what you're running. And traditionally we think of in polymers, we run five to 10 milligrams. And for pure materials, maybe one to five milligrams. We have a people that run explosives. They run one milligram or less. So it depends on how much energy you're measuring. Now the mass of the sample will affect the DSC data. And here we show indium, and we're showing from 0.5 milligrams up to 10 milligrams ran at 10 degrees a minute. And when we plot that data versus temperature, you can see at the bigger sample, it broadens the peak. It shortens the peak. Now, if I integrate the area, they're all going to be the same. So I'm going to get the same answer. But you can see the sharpness of the peak is broadened out when we have a bigger sample. It's important that you understand that. And a smaller sample is going to give me better separation and better resolution. When we look at TGA, there's multiple pans on TGA. And sometimes the pans are used because of temperature range. Sometimes they're used because of sample. Sometimes they're used because of the size of the sample. And the top layer of pans that are shown in this slide show the Q50 and the Q500 pans where we got 50 and 100 microliter platinum pans. We have 100 microliter aluminum pans. We have ceramic pans that are available in 100, 250, and 500 microliters. So as I go to bigger samples, I can put them in that bigger walled pan of the 500 microliter ceramic. When I go to the Discovery TGA, I have 50 microliter 
and 100 microliter platinum. I have aluminum pans that can be sealed, and I also have ceramic pans. But we don't have the big 500 microliter pan for the ceramics, but we do have a 250 microliter pan. Now, deep walled pans are better for large masses, but you have to be careful putting too much mass in the TGA, because as we heat it, it's gonna change the profile. We're gonna look at that here in the next slide or two. And if we look at the SDT pans, we've got different pans for platinum and ceramic. The platinum pans are available in 40 and 110 microliter, the ceramic in 40 and 90 microliter. Typically we use 90 microliter ceramic pans in the SDT, that gives us our best DSC performance. But you can use any of those pans on the SDT. I've even used aluminum T0 pans as long as I'm careful to keep the maximum temperature below 600 degrees. Now when I'm using these pans, the pan type I use depends upon the sample, the mass, etc. as we mentioned. Platinum pans are relatively easy to clean. We burn them up. We heat them up and burn off the sample and leave the platinum behind. They're non-porous, but they can alloy with most metals. Alumina or ceramic pans, they're corrosive. They are good for corrosives and inorganic samples. They're good for larger samples. Sometimes they're a little bit harder to clean because there's a little bit of porosity into it, but you can usually clean that out and wash that out and then burn them up to burn up the sample. Aluminum pans are really just used for one time. You can't really clean those effectively. You can clean them in a solvent, but you can't burn the sample out of it. If you heat it up to burn the sample, you melt the aluminum. So aluminum pans, I don't use that often, and when I do, it's just for a single use. Now, separate, sample preparation on TGA. In DSC, I talked about that the ideal sample was a film that laid in the bottom of the pan. In TGA, the ideal sample is a powder that's spread evenly over the bottom of the pan. But once again, I make whatever I have fit. Now, if I have a big chunk of sample, a big pellet or a part, I can cut that into multiple small pieces and distribute that in the pan to give me better resolution, better data. That's going to be a better than running one big chunk of sample. Sample weight I alluded to earlier, but 10 to 20 milligrams is typical for most applications. If I really are looking at very small volatiles, I might want to run a bigger sample, like 50 to 100 milligrams. One thing to remember, what's your baseline drift? If my TGA has a baseline drift of 25 micrograms and I'm running a 10 milligram sample, that's a quarter of a percent. If I'm only running a one milligram sample, that's gonna be two and a half percent. So these are the things I need to think about when I'm determining my sample size. Too big a sample is also gonna affect your data though. It's going to shift the data. And here we show the same sample. It's a over-the-counter cold allergy tablet one is as a chunk, just a chunk of the tablet, and the other is finely ground powder. And the powder is the blue curve and the chunk is the green curve. And you can see the overall weight loss is similar except it's shifted along the temperature in the x-axis because as we get to that bigger sample, it takes longer for the heat to get into the sample and it broadens out that weight change. If I want better resolution, I want better, re re better data, I want a smaller sample, not the bigger sample. Now, as we said, sample size, 10 to 20 milligrams is pretty much ideal. If I want volatiles, I might go to a little bit bigger sample. Other reasons that you might want to use a large sample. Maybe you want to analyze production form, like a whole pellet. Maybe I've got a pellet that I want to put the whole thing in there, or a tablet. Or maybe it's a small part, I'm going to put the whole sample part in there. And I can do that. The other thing that people run bigger samples is because they're concerned that the sample's not very homogeneous. And so then by thinking by running a bigger sample, I've got a better way to make that measurement. But the thing you gotta be careful about, if I have a drum of material and I know it's not very homogeneous, 10 milligrams may not be very representative, but is 100 milligrams? That's still not very representative. I'm better off taking multiple samples out of that, averaging it, and getting the data that way. In this case, the data are statistically more accurate than by running one large sample. 
Now the effect of sample size is shown here. We're running polyethylene and we go from 2.7 milligrams up to 17.6 milligrams. These are all done at 10 degrees a minute. And you see the shift in the TGA curves and in the inset we see the derivative that shows the maximum rate of weight loss and the temperatures they occur at. And here we're seeing a shift of about 10 degrees over that change in weight. So as I go to bigger samples, it's going to shift my transitions to a higher temperature. I need to be aware of that. It's okay, but I need to be aware of that. A Knudsen cell is a cell that's a small capsule. Typically, we use a hermetic DSC pan with a pinhole lid. We put the liquid or the volatile samples in that and we seal the lid. Now this pinhole is very small. We sell lids that have a point or 75 micron hole in them. So that way when I start heating it up in the TGA, some of the volatiles come out. But that small hole retards all that volatiles coming out at once. And that can give me better separation for things like hydrates when I have multiple weight losses that may come off on the same point. So here we're going to look at that data in the, in the next slide. But one thing to remember, is don't forget to tear the TGA pan with the Knudsen cell on it or the Hermetic DSC cell on that pan before I load my sample. That way I get the accurate weight loss. So here we have copper sulfate pentahydrate. The blue curve is in a standard open TGA pan and we see one broad weight loss followed by a plateau and a second weight loss. When we look at the Knudsen cell where we put it in a DSC pan with a Hermetic lid and that 75 micron pinhole, we see it shifted to a little bit higher temperatures. But we also see that first weight loss is now two steps. It's not just a single step. We can get better separation and resolution there. And then we see the, the third weight loss step for that curve coming out at a little bit higher temperature. So when you're running hydrates and you're trying to get better separation between the different hydrates, a Knudsen cell is a very good way to go. Well, thank you. This concludes this first segment, Instrument and Sample Preparation. A recorded version of this will be archived and available on TA Instruments website. Please stay tuned for the next segment, Method Development and Thermal Techniques. Thank you very much. That concludes our first segment, Instrument and Sample Preparation. A recorded version of this segment and the entire presentation is available through the TA Instruments website. Join us for the second segment in this series, where we take a look into efficient and effective method development.